ChatGPT grew by like 9,900% in 60 days and then drops 10% in a month. So I think in the grand scheme, like it's a tiny blip, but it is interesting that it stopped growing. Hello, hello. Hi, hi. How's it going? Mr. Cordoba, how are things? Great. Just living the dream. <laughs> I'm uh, in a lot of different time zones, so my sleep's a little messed up. But other than that, very happy, content, grateful. Wonderful to hear. Wonderful to hear. I like those those positive affirmations about life. <laughs> Today, we're going to be talking about a different type of life, an artificial form, as some might think. Uh, and specifically, we're going to jump into the topic of super alignment. Sounds like super AI. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. Kicking it off is this blog from OpenAI where they introduced the con concept of super alignment. So let's begin there. Bradley, what is super alignment? Why is it? Yes, so super alignment is a composite word made of super and alignment. And we've talked about what alignment is, but just to review, it's making sure that if you ask an AI to do something, it'll do not only what you said, but more importantly, it'll do what you mean, right? You've probably been in a relationship don't do what I said, do what I mean. And um, that's what alignment is about. And th this is already a difficult problem to solve with the current state of AI intelligence. And so you can imagine this just gets amplified with super intelligence. And that's where the word super comes in. So it's not only just alignment between humans or AI in its current form, it's alignment between humans and super intelligence. And, and super intelligence is different than just artificial general intelligence, AGI. Super intelligence is intelligence that could be even 10, 100 orders of magnitude smarter than us. So it's a it's a more difficult problem than just general alignment. And I think that's why they used the words super alignment. Right, right. Makes sense. Thanks for that clarification. So, you know, they have this problem. What's the what's the solution that they're proposing here to this super alignment challenge? Yeah, so they briefly talked about their approach. So their goal is to create an AI that can help them research AI. So it's like an AI that is going to help the humans, help us make sure that when super intelligence comes, there'll be alignment. So their goal is to build a roughly human kind of same intelligence as a human researcher. And then what they can do is when they have something that's roughly as good as a human, then they can scale it with the vast amount of compute that they have to iteratively step after step, day after day, align the humans with this super intelligence. And so they're not trying to say, hey, how do we do this? Let, let's solve let's solve alignment. They're actually taking a systems level approach. And this is this is also how you build a company. This is this is how we build our company is I tell people, hey, don't just build the company, build the systems which build the company. And so they're taking a similar approach here. They're not just solving alignment. They're building an AI that can solve alignment, which I think is a really interesting approach. And there's this canonical blog post by Richard Sutton, and uh, we'll, we'll link it below. But in his blog post, he essentially talks about that this is a really good strategy. And I think this is something we, we've learned recently with deep learning and how it's beat all the other machine learning methods is that if you can take a problem and then you can frame it in such a way that the thing gets smarter with more compute, well, because of Moore's law, because if we've seen the the new Moore's law of AI, it's going to win out, and that that's going to be the the best method. So you think this is a good approach to the problem? Like you think this could actually solve it? Yeah, I think it's the smartest approach. It all comes down to the framing. So they said we're trying to solve super alignment, meaning we want to align with super intelligence. But just say it was the blog post was called like GPT three alignment. Then I don't think it's the right approach. There's probably just uh, a few algorithms you can pop in there, or maybe something simpler, or maybe just continuing the the reinforcement learning with human feedback. With this very ambitious goal of aligning the super intelligent, I I think it's the only way to do it. And so so. Why is that? Well, it's the same reason why computers are so valuable. So there's this concept called abstraction. And so abstraction simply means if you want to drive a car, you don't need to know, let's say, the detailed physics and engineering of like an internal combustion engine, or you don't you don't need to know how fluid hydraulics work, um, right? So all you need to know is uh, if I turn the wheel counterclockwise, the car is going to turn left. If I turn it clockwise, it's going to turn right. If I hit this pedal on the right, it's going to go fast. If I hit the pedal in the left or the middle, if you have a clutch, it's going to stop. So 
the car provides an abstraction. Sometimes there's stronger abstractions or weaker abstractions or same with computers. I just know if I type this key, an H goes on the screen. I don't need to know how Maxwell's equations or how the engineering of microprocessors. And so abstractions are powerful in that, let's just say, for example, a human can only operate, let's say they can only move like six symbols at a time. Well, even if that's true, you could say, well, eventually humans intelligence is going to run out. But if you keep providing abstractions and one of the symbols is manipulating a whole computer, well, you can imagine that if you keep building more advanced things like more advanced AI, more advanced computers, more advanced machines. I only need to think about six things, but under those six things are going to be millions and trillions and quadrillions of things that, I, that I'm operating. And so I think using this same idea is, is the same reason why building an AI uh, alignment researcher that can improve itself with compute is the right idea because of abstraction. And so in the analogy with the car is, does the augmented alignment researcher understand how the car or the algorithm works or are they operating? Like, is that the abstraction or yeah, I, how does I, that play out? So that's an open question. But if I had to guess, I would say, well, people don't really know how DBT4 works, right? You you have an idea, yeah, exactly. um, but, but you're not... You're not like, this neuron does this, and we don't know how our brains work fully. So I don't, I, I think they'll know how to create it, and I think they'll know how to train it, how to validate it, and kind of figure out how misalignment happens. Like, they'll, they'll know how to manipulate it. They call it adversarial testing. So they'll know a lot about it, and they'll know how to create it, but I don't think they'll understand it really, is my guess. yeah. I mean, and they say it's like roughly human level. So I guess that means it's like outpaced us. Is that worrisome? I mean, because because the approach sort of describes the machines always being a, a step ahead of us in a way. Does that concern you? or do, Because like in the instance of a car, someone knows exactly how it works. Even if I don't know how it works, my dad does. You know, he could build one. He knows how it works. So he could tell you. <laughs> Specifically, well, when you push the pedal, this is what's happening. Whereas with this, that's where the analogy falls apart. So I'm just wondering, like, how, how does it work there where, like, the algorithm is ahead of the researcher? Yeah. I mean, even... Or, like, nobody think, understands a full machine. Yeah, I was going to say, like, let's even just take the car analogy or, or an airplane. Like, um, and I maybe I don't want to use your dad because maybe he does. But at, at a certain point, like, <laughs> I'm, I'm not... I'm not really sure if, let's say, well, let's just say someone else's dad, because <laughs> I don't want to like diss your dad, or like when we're in kindergarten, it's like my dad could beat up yours. It's okay, <laughs> like you can diss. <laughs> well, I just don't know, but it, I, I would, I, I would pose a question that if you took one person, let's say the most qualified person in the world, let's say that was your dad, I don't know if they would know how to go mine the ore out of some mine, right, or like know where to look to get some metal that makes up the block of the engine. And then there's the smelting process. And beyond the smelting process, there's a whole supply chain to create the robots and build even the big pot to to melt the, melt the metal and then melting the metal itself. Like, so there's just almost an infinite kind of regression of things that needed to happen, like starting with the, like the discovery of fire that when you really look at it, I don't know if one person understands that all, or like, do they understand the physics of things in order to yeah. build like these heat curves? Like, I don't know. I think a lot is abstractions. And I bet someone means when they say like they can build the car, it's like they understand how the engine works and that they, if they get a piston and they put on the crankshaft and the valves, they could build the engine and then put in the transmission. And I think there's people who could do that. But the whole thing from scratch, I would even say in the car level, no one understands. The whole thing. It's like once you start zooming out and you get the thousand foot view, you realize it's even a, even you thought the car was complex and you zoom out. It's like, oh, well, there's even there's so much more to this. Right. And, and so yeah. so I, I would say see that I would say. Given a level of abstraction, someone could build it. Like so, given massive compute, given the right data, given the right ideas, the right team, then I think someone could build another alignment researcher. In just like they could build a car if they had the pistons built, if they had screwdrivers and all that. I think people could build cars, but understanding everything may be 
hard, improbable, or it actually may be impossible. Like it may be impossible for you to ever experience my first 10 level of consciousness, what it feels like to be me. That just may be impossible. And, and I don't know if it's the same. Thing. So it kind of makes me think like the initial problem that OpenAI is trying to solve is to create a roughly human level alignment researcher that could help test and get give insights into how we can align super intelligence. But is it possible that eventually the AI will become so capable that we could simply ask it to create its own alignment researcher that understands everything about how it works? Yeah, so so this is kind of the, the dream, every nerd's dream ever who's ever worked on AI. So <laughs> th th this is kind of colloquially known as a singularity. And maybe let me just give a, a rough intuition about the singularity. So the basic, so maybe we go back to, I don't even remember when we learned this, but at, at the very least in your kind of second semester of calculus when you're studying infinite series. So here's kind of the, the statement. If you take numbers like um, one half, and then you add one fourth, and you add one eighth, and you add one sixteenth, and you keep doing this. So this is kind of what, what this symbol means, one over two to the n, where n goes from one to infinity. So if you keep doing that, the, the surprising thing is that this equals one. And uh, I remember I had an argument with my dad about this, and it was like, it's like you can never add an infinite number of things. And But th there's just a, a mathematical result. And, and visually, you can see it as if you add half the square, and then a fourth the square, and then an eighth the square, and the sixteenth, and the thirty-second, and the sixty-fourth, and you keep going. Well, eventually that'll be a whole square. And so the the idea is 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 these are called um, geometric series. And so the reason why exponentials happen is because the future is proportional to the past. And so the idea is is when when we put more transistors in our computer our computers get more powerful and then we can use those more powerful computers to design better chips. And so maybe it took, let's say a half a year to do it. And now it takes a fourth of a year and an eighth of a year and then a 16th of a year. Um, and it doesn't matter that it's a year, we could say two years, but this, the same thing holds. And so mm -hmm. if you have a system where the future benefit is proportional to the past, then you get exponential growth. And you get this idea that if it grows in such a way you can have an infinite number of iterations in a finite amount of time. And that's kind of the, the promise of the singularity is that in this case, you said if the system can build itself, meaning it gets smarter and then it, then it builds itself better and then it itself builds itself better and then itself builds itself better. You can essentially at some point get an infinite number of iterations, like this infinite series. We talked about this one half, one fourth, one sixteenth. And if each time it gets faster, well, mm -hmm. you can base it can basically infinitely improve itself in a finite amount of time. And so like this was first called Zeno's paradox, but that's a singularity and it's both scary, exciting, and uh yeah, I mean that could happen. And so to like add a little bit of context for the listener like that wouldn't just necessarily be an ai alignment researcher right that's like that could apply to all kinds of technology that could be microprocessors that could be gpus that could be ugh. and so you reach this point where then it's all just exactly i mean it even happened like if you just look at the wealth distribution in a company in a, in a country it's exponent or it's zip distributed or it's exponentially distributed because if you if you get money well, then you can, let's say, you can either lend the money and then you get interest. And then if I get, let's say, 2% interest, well, I have 2% more and then I can lend that out and then get 2% more. And so that's also kind of exponential growth. Or if I own stock in a company, it's the same thing. And so this idea of the future being proportional to the past applies to so many different systems. And so if you can apply it to AI, then you get exponential growth and, and things like the singularity. And exactly this, this is not just specific to the alignment researcher, but it's more general and could apply to the alignment researcher. Yeah, crazy, man. It makes me think of a hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy. <laughs> like the, la the meaning of life, the universe and everything is 42. It's one actually, guys. <laughs> it's all just one. Well, any other questions on them. this one? Yeah, let's jump back to this. So, I mean, they say they're dedicating 20% of the compute they've secured over the next four years to solving this problem. Do you think that's enough? Like, in generally speaking, is this enough? 
but also like specifically is the 20% enough? Yeah. So, no, yeah. I mean, obviously I don't know, but 20% feels right. Like we've been talking about exponential growth and with exponential growth comes Pareto distributions or as it's in its vernacular, the, the 80, 20 rule. <laughs> and so maybe they're just like, Hey, let's 80, 20, this let's put 80% to actually building things and 20% to building things that make sure it's not going to kill us. Like, I don't know. It seems reasonable to me. I, I don't know what number I, I was thinking of what number I would choose. And I would probably just feel like 80, 20 it. Yeah. I think you're probably right. <laughs> so on this topic, I mean, I, I don't have anything else. I mean, this is, it's an interesting one and maybe there's like some more details to be ironed out here, but we do have some more open yeah. AI well, maybe related one, discussion. One last topics. thought um, there. Sorry to interrupt. Sure. There's a bit of delay. I'm just happy they're doing that, right? Like what other companies dedicating, like 20% is a lot. <laughs> I mean, if they're, if it takes like yeah. $10 million, like to just train one model, like actually they've said it's probably hundreds of millions of dollars. So like $20 million, like it's a big investment. I mean, it's pretty amazing. I my like my hats off to them. Do you think it speaks to the seriousness in which they take this problem and the severity of the problem itself? Right. There's the, there's the classic put your money where your mouth is and there's not a better right. way to, in AI to like put your compute where your mouth is. That's like the most important thing. So <laughs> They're putting their compute where their mouth is. I like that. Put your compute where your mouth is, guys. <laughs> so, I mean, on a oh, on a different note, there was there was a headline, and it's talking about how ChatGPT users have dropped for the first time. And this specifically, this data shows that use decreased by nearly 10% from May to June. I'm just curious, off the cuff, what, what are your thoughts about this? Is this meaningful or not? Well, I, I, I think... So two thoughts, two clear thoughts. Like, so first of all, ChatGPT grew by like 9,900% in 60 days and then drops 10% in a month. So I think in the grand scheme, like it's a tiny blip, but it is interesting that it, that it stopped growing. And, and then, so there's a lot of questions there. I don't, I don't have the answers to, but I'll just provide a few thoughts. Um, so like they gain a million users in five days, a hundred million active users, like by January, 2023. And so like, what is actually the, the, the market? Like, did they just get the whole market? Or I, I mean, I guess there's 8 billion people, but I mean, not everyone has computers and it, it is in the market, but so there, there's a bunch of questions. So if I had to guess, like, I would say, I don't know, maybe 20% of the users are students just kind of taking a small sample with, with big air bars. And so it's summer vacation and maybe just a bunch of people are taking vacation. And so 10% doesn't feel like bad. I mean, we need to see, I, I think some other ideas are, I think people, there was just a, a cool factor, a hype factor. Now there's, there's bar, there's other things. I think people are realizing that sometimes Google is also still good at doing stuff. So like, I know people who like literally now use yeah. everything for chat GPT and I'm like, well, that's probably just better to be used on Google. <laughs> and so I, I think yeah. there's just maybe students, people realizing like the old tools still work just as well and maybe the market size. But I mean, I'm not super worried. I mean, I think this technology is here to stay. I think they'll definitely be, there's always, maybe we can bring up the Gartner hype cycle where you you kind of have the euphoria and then it goes down and then most of the value happens after that. And so I don't think this technology is any different than kind of any other technology that, that follows the same, same curve. But I, I think maybe the 10% is a blip. But I do think it raises is a question about its usability. I use it every day. I've been using BAR, I've been using open source, I've been using our models and the user experience could be improved. And like we've had these kind of jumps in user experience from just the, the command line to Windows to VR. And I think there could be a big improvement just in the product itself. Like I still get a lot of errors. It's a bit slow. And so maybe to kind of keep it going, they need to make these big jumps, which I, I know you wanted to talk about some of these improvements they're making maybe th that will increase the retention so yeah Deb, let's, let's do that but also where do you so where would you say we've got the hype cycle here like where would you say we are right now 
Well, I think we're at the peak of inflated expectations. Well, okay. So we're I mean, I, I like I've never seen like when when my mother's talking about it, when like people that just are really late adopters or even laggards of technology are talking about it and asking me about it. Then I'm like, okay, either yeah. either we're at the peak or before like right before the peak, but I think we're close to that. I I've never seen something like this, you know. I feel like this was a really slow boil. Like it's been percolating for a long time, and then it was like poof, we hit. Yeah, the, we we really hit the peak where mom's asking about it. Like, oh my God, right? Yeah, I think there was. Yeah, a lot of, I, I, I tend to agree with you. I think it's. I think there was a lot of latent energy, as you said. Sorry, we're up the over the over the last fifty years, waiting to kind of release this, and I think it's a moment to shine. And also, I think other technologies have kind of been a flop like VR and I think kind of the last big breakthrough was was in mobile in 2007 and there's been promise of blockchain VR and yeah. I don't think those have lived up to their hype yet I mean maybe there'll be a great application of blockchain or, or VR and so I think people are also just kind of waiting for something yeah and I mean back to what you were saying about this idea of the singularity perhaps AI can be the key to unlocking some of the value that's kind of buried in these other things but like you know yeah. headlines aside like the media wants to talk about the fact that they lost users then I think you're right about it interestingly there have been like major updates to chat GPT and the availability of the GPT-4 model that kind of align right with this headline coming out so I mean I think probably these are the biggest changes since GPT-4 came out so to start, we can look at the availability of the uh, the GPT-4 API to all paying OpenAI customers. Could you just explain what that means to people and, and the significance of it? Yeah, definitely. So GPT-4 is a much bigger, more intelligent model than GPT-3.5 Turbo. And so they've only released it to select customers as you should when you release something very powerful and intelligent and so now most people can access uh, a better and smarter and more reliable more trustworthy more aligned model did they also increase the token limit and also for the listeners who don't know what's a token limit yeah so every time you run chat gbt what it is is it's, it's a big neural network and all a neural network is is a bunch of multiplications and additions it, matrix multiplications and so it takes a lot of memory to do a part of this attention mechanism. It grows quadratically. And so when you have a, a sequence of, of tokens, of, of words, well, it grows kind of, let's say there's N tokens. It grows by N squared in the, in the memory usage. And so it takes a lot of memory to have a lot of tokens in there. And so that's what they mean by the token limit. And so GPT 3.5 had a little over 4,000. GPT 4 ha had an 8,000 token limit. And they've just released some, some much bigger ones like 16,000, 32,000. And that'll just make things much easier. We spend a lot of our time overcoming token limits and so those aren't released to everybody but they just make things much much easier they're a little more expensive as you probably could predict because they use more memory but they're much more useful you can just feed books in there yeah that's awesome yeah the way i've thought about the token limit is like and correct me if i'm wrong but it's like let's say i type in a prompt via chat gpt hey do this and it it's doing that next token prediction based off my question it predicts the next word it should reply and it using that it then rereads my question and it thinks about what the first word it predicted was and then it predicts the next one. And is that like a right way to think about it? Like the longer your prompt is, the more tokens you're going to be using because every time it's got to like go back through this long prompt and think about, you know, does is there a value there in like in condensing your prompts then or yeah. you just need the token limit to become infinite? Well, it's kind of the question of, let's say you're using a really old computer, you're like grandma's computer and it's like, uh, well, should we download video? Or should we just like not use so much bandwidth on this computer or let's say a really slow dial up internet? Well, if you only had dial up, yeah, then probably we should make our websites only text and, and very fast. But that's not the ultimate answer, right? We want to stream video and yeah. cat videos. And so eventually we, it would be nice to okay. yeah put the whole internet on there at once and have that in its working memory. So the more tokens it has, the more kind of short term memory or even long-term memory your model has. Makes sense. It makes sense. 
So the other big update here is about the av the availability of this plugin. Um, I don't know if the audience is familiar with plugins. So to start, maybe could you just tell people what is a ChatGPT plugin? Yeah. So so we have ChatGPT, which is a large neural network that was trained on data before 2021 in 2021 and before. And you can ask it things and it'll tell you things back based on its own knowledge. What plugins are are taking that very intelligent AI, the ChatGPT, um, and this only works for ChatGPT4, and it teaches it how to use tools. So this is kind of the, the missing link. We're all talking about how it's unreliable, makes up stuff. And so plugins are an attempt to teach the AI how to use tools. So if I said, Chris, what's like the square root of 49.1249? I don't know. Maybe you'd just be annoyed with me and make something up or or just not. But if I'm like, okay, you're like, wait, hold on. And you just use your iPhone. It, it's a really easy thing to do. And so you don't like you're unbelievably intelligent and there's still things you can't solve. And so with tools, this is what allowed humans to transcend our immediate environment and become the dominant species on, on the planet. And this is also about abstraction. And so why wouldn't the same be true with AI? Well, of course it is. So that's what plugins are. <laughs> and I didn't want to jump ahead. I kind of jumped straight to Code Interpreter, but um, there are a number of, of different plugins that companies have created too, so that you could integrate the information and abilities that their tools offer directly into the ChatGPT interface. So you could maybe research a trip and book it with Expedia uh, simply by by chatting with ChatGPT. The big one though that, that I wanted us to talk about is not really these, they're super cool. And I guess like, is, is it accurate to think that rather than having to teach ChatGPT new information, we can just give it access to existing information and unlock kind of its abilities? Yes. And I mean, not even... Would you say that's, that's accurate? Yeah, sorry, there's a delay. Yeah, not even just existing okay. information, like existing or existing tools, right? So it can use Wolfram Alpha you had there, which is its own symbolic compute engine. So if... Uh, ChatGPT is not good at solving integrals. Well, now now it is because it, it can use Wolfram Alpha or new actions, right? Like now it's just stuck in its little computer. Now it can book flights for you. It can book restaurants. It, it, so it's not only improving its information, which of course is true, but it's, it can use more tools and also take actions. It's, so there's kind of this sense in which it's, in, it, it's having an, an embodiment in, in the virtual world. Hey, Siri, <laughs> ChatGPT is coming for your lunch that's how I <laughs> oh geez i just triggered siri on my iphone <laughs> it's like so, no thank you not. for that thank you for that uh, yeah it's like what's chat gpt <laughs> knowing siri so the one i want to talk about though is code interpreter and this i think this is coming any day now to any paying chat gpt user could you kind of walk us through this and the significance of this yeah so the code interpreter like Wolfram Alpha we talked about or the open table integration is another tool that ChatGPT can use to make itself better. And so what it can do is it can use Python code. So it can write Python code, read Python code, modify Python code. You can handle uploads and downloads. And uh, so this is kind of a, remember we were just talking about what if it can write its own code? Well, this code interpreter, it's sandboxed and firewalled so that it doesn't get out of control and, and start writing code on the internet or, or modifying its own code. To, to have misalignment. So it's sandbox, which I think is smart, but maybe it can trick some human to to unsandbox it. But I think this is kind of the big thing we want. I think the big one of the big things was like give it access to the internet. Like it runs Google searches so it has knowledge. And then give it access to tools and then give it access to actions. And then just so it's made out of code, right? Right now, AI is made out of code and, and there's kind of abstractions on that, like weights and data and stuff. But in the end, it's made out of code. This is how we build this stuff. And so it's essentially teaching it how to make itself. So so we're made of proteins and different physiological processes. So it's akin to saying, hey, Chris, I'm giving you the tools to build brains, to build livers, to create what you're made out of. I mean, so this is a big step and it's really amazing. And if you look at the demos, they're really cool and impressive. But I think the the big promise here, the big excitement here, what everyone's in the back of their head thinking about is, is what you said earlier. Like, is this a step to the singularity? And it obviously is. Yeah. 
I mean, big picture, right? That's that's crazy. And you know, just we'll, we will put some in the comments or in the description. We'll put some links to demos because, like Brad said, they are super impressive. Um, I, I watched this a few weeks ago. Somebody who had access to it, and they show all, all these complex data visualizations, data analysis, things that would take a human a really long time to just sit down and do. I mean, it just boom, you upload it, it spits it back out, and you can use it. Like the visualizations are quite nice. So even if we don't go all the way to super intelligence, it's like a pretty big step, I feel like, in unlocking the functionality just for like, you know, the declining user base of, of Chad. <laughs> and I use ChatGPT a lot. Actually, I used it a lot more in the beginning to write code. I, I use it less to write code now. But I think just this ability and in, in it'll Absolutely. so I, I've been using it less because I've just found its limitations. And I also just realized I'm faster writing code on my own. And I mean, I've been programming since I was yeah five or six. So maybe I'm an anomaly there. But for me, it's in the beginning, it was kind of cool because it could do stuff. But then I realized it makes very hidden errors. And it, it maybe helps you if you write a very isolated thing. But the simple fact of you kind of lose control makes you also lose control of the debugging piece. And so it needs to just be a little bit more reliable before I would use it again but if it's just cre like creating plots and, and things like that that you can easily verify the output then i think it's fine but i i've been writing like a lot of complex code and so i've been using it to write code less but i think this will put the code in the mainstream and, and help Im improve that so th that'll be good do you think you could apply the abstraction analogy to this experience you're currently having with it like on a tiny level does that make sense yeah no, it does make sense. So yeah, exactly. So let me just kind of take a few steps back to kind of just show the the arc beyond just, just one point. So how we programmed in the beginning is we would solder wires together. And then we, we would have like ALU logic to ca calculate Fibonacci sequences or add things. And you could only do that by literally putting hardware together. And and then we had like binary code, which made that a bit easier. So we weren't soldering wires, but you were literally writing zeros and ones. So you could only do pretty simple stuff. And, and, and then we had an abstraction on that where you could write assembly language, which would compile into binary. And then we had compilers, which would compile C code into assembly, which would then get converted into zeros and ones. And then we had Python code. Then, then we had UIs where we could click and, and drag, and then we had phones where we could swipe. And so now we're just getting to a point where the level of abstraction is, uh, I want you to plot the birth rate from 1921 to the present day and highlight any anomalies, right? And so not only will it go to Google, get the data somewhere, write some code to, to crunch what I wanted, write some visualization code. And so that abstraction will happen on that level. And I think this is a big step in, in terms of that abstraction. I really like that plotting it along the continuity and kind of seeing how it really fits in in its own place it's it's really interesting and it's exciting i'm super excited about this i I'm, i can't wait to get access so is there anything anything else on this i think we can move on if you're good yeah no i think it's good so the final the final thing we wanted to talk about was a little open source ditty it's called meta gpt you want to kind of just explain this one before we before we get to the video yeah so what you do is you you write this one line description of, of what you want and in, in the demo i think you're going to show they say write a command line chess game so you you make this kind of one line requirement or not chess blackjack game or poker game i forgot what it was but anyways you have this one line requirement as input and then it outputs things typical product managers want like user stories competitive analysis requirements data structures documentation and so this is along this thread we've been talking about of uh, of generating code yeah so a few things one is i think what makes this kind of new era of ai so impressive is it demos so well right like i mean just play the demo it's pretty cool yeah let's go and uh they they just run it and they say write a cli blackjack game and then it does a bunch of cool command line i always love the command line because it makes you feel like some like hacker in the movies but you see like yeah. create an ai deal like they kind of skip past uh, some stuff, but there was some requirements they wrote in there. Yeah. And so anyways, long story short, go watch it. But you you can actually play blackjack from the command line. And obviously the, the cherry picked example, wh whatever. But it's, it's amazing. This is cool. Like this is just really cool. And even though when you try it, it doesn't work as good in all the cases, 
it works good in this case, the cherry picked example. I, I don't care. It's still cool. And what I always say is to truly understand something and what it can do, you have to truly understand what it can't do. If I wanted to know how big this table was, I wouldn't just walk around the center of the table. I would keep going until I find the edge. And then I'd go the other side and find the edge. And then the other side and, the fi and find the edge. And so to truly understand the power of what AI can do, you need to understand what AI can't do. And I would recommend you to do that on your own. But what it can do is really cool. And we're all kind of we're all kind of in the same boat, right? We're we're discovering the limitations together in this massive hundred million strong experiment. So yeah, on that note, I mean, I, I don't have any further questions on Meta GPT, but this was a good one. I feel like yeah, really and maybe just one more thought because that triggered. I, I liked what you said that we're all in it together, and I'm really happy sure. we're all in it together, and I'm and I'm happy Google released the Transformers paper. I, I'm I'm happy OpenAI despite being more closed than we, than we hoped, are, are still quite open in releasing this in, in the way they have. Because we all are discovering this together and, and then it's beautiful. And I think maybe a, a slightly more practical thing I've noticed in its limitations, which I just want to point out, is a lot of these applications are low stakes consumer applications that demo well when you try them out. They don't work as well as you thought, but still kind of cool and you can see the promise. Where it's really important that you don't want to get caught up in the hype is in your enterprise or high stakes applications. And this is where we spend spent years and years and years researching and, and are implementing now is making this stuff safe. And so in Super AI, we, we're building this enterprise AI application that takes some of this stuff, but it, it's much safer. And our stuff doesn't write poetry. It's not as kind of not as hypey, but it does really boring stuff really well, very safely very reliably. And we're just noticing that's what a lot of people want. And so we're, we're seeing this bifurcation of kind of the family tree of AI, let's say bifurcate into these cool, fancy consumer demos, and let's say slightly more boring, but reliable use cases in the enterprise. And, and we're personally working on the, the ladder of, of making this safe. We made a lot of good progress. There's still a lot to go, but um, yeah, just wanted to call that out. Yeah, that's awesome, Brad. Thanks for sharing. And uh, can you speak to that a little bit more, like the the specific common challenges and obstacles, and kind of just comprehensively, what's the what's the approach there? Yeah. So, good question. The so the big thing is AI. We're living in a new world, and the results that AI have shown us have been astounding and miraculous. But it's no panacea. As we've talked about many times, the AI hallucinates, can't be trusted. You don't know when it fails. It sometimes silently fails. And so how do you handle that? Well, you, you need to kind of approach it with, with a different goal in mind uh, of, of reliability. And this happens on many different areas. But one of the most important things is not just its accuracy, which is really important, but its accuracy about its accuracy. So you don't just want it to say something, you want to say its confidence and about what it said. So there's nothing worse than, I don't want to use politicians, but just people who say things confidently, but they're confidently wrong. Like I'm actually, I'm actually fine with people saying like, oh, I read this headline. I didn't read the article. I don't know if it's true. I really have no idea about it, but this is what it said. And it could be false, but if they say it like that, I'm actually fine with that. The best is if like, I studied this for 50 years, I'm really confident about it. And it's true, right? And so, so right. not only do we make the AI more accurate and in narrow regimes, we constrain it more like extracting information out of documents or analyzing images for text or analyzing other you know, financial records. So we constrain the AI to use all its intelligence in one narrow field. And so that increases the accuracy, but we also restrict the AI to be less creative, um, to have to have less room for hallucination. And so not only do we improve its accuracy, but we improve its accuracy about its accuracy. And then we've also developed like over 150 different techniques to like trust but verify, right? So not only do we increase its accuracy, its accuracy about its accuracy, but we have over 150 different techniques to just verify that it actually is accurate, including having humans in the loop, uh, many, many other things. So that's kind of a high level approach. Yeah, it makes sense. Would it be accurate to say it's like the difference between building this creative but unpredictable AI that might surprise you pleasantly or not so pleasantly and building like reliable executioner? It's like, I want this guy to just do this. Right. right. Exactly. 
Yeah, so it's like a, let's say um, some kind of autistic scientist that is like cold calculations. I mean, it's not like the best marketing term for that, but yeah. <laughs> but if you know, you know. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Well, hey, this was a this was a great one, Brad. It was great chatting with you, man. All right, cheers, Chris. Bye.